Tablet 1 of the Lost Book of Inky begins with a flash forward chronologically to the end of Tablet 14. The dramatic recount of the desolation of Sumer and surrounding areas in ancient Mesopotamia explains that an evil wind of poisoned air originated in a distant plain and caused the great calamity. Inky states that his brother Enlil, along with Ninhurzag, Ninurta, and Inky's own son Nergal, were responsible for the decision to use the poisoned weapons. Inky explains their decision to use the weapons of Terra was one of fate and not destiny. The decision to use these weapons of Terra was predicated on the ascendancy claims against Inky's firstborn son Marduk. A significant number of the Anunnaki were opposed to Marduk and or his son Nabu. Ninurta, Nergal, Ningizida, Nanur, Ishkar, Utu, and Inanna all had their own personal motivations to move against Marduk and his son. Although Inki was in the minority defending his son Marduk, he forcefully convinced the other Anunnaki to exclude the earthlings in this conflict. Anu, Inki's father who had remained on their home planet Nibiru, approved the use of the weapons, but also for the people to be spared. Consequently, Enlil summoned Nergal and Ninurta to his chambers in order to reveal the weapon's location. At this point, Inki's narrative moves further back chronologically to what he calls the Prior Times. He explains that in the Prior Times, there were no gods or humans on Earth. The gods resided on the great planet Nibiru, which possessed an elongated circuit around our sun. He describes Nibiru as having a reddish radiance from a thick atmosphere fed by constant volcanic eruptions. Inki describes the planet-wide evolution of his ancestors into northern and southern hemispheric factions. A global war lasting thousands of our years persisted on Nibiru, which greatly diminished all life on the planet. Eventually a truce was declared. A warrior from the north named An and a maiden from the south named Antu were chosen to unify the two factions through marriage and the subsequent creation of a new royal lineage. Anki, the firstborn of their three sons, was seated on the throne. After Anki died without a male heir, the middle son, Anib, was pronounced the new heir. He chose Ninib, the daughter of his youngest brother, as his spouse. Anib and Ninib bore a son named An Shargal, who became the fourth king of Nibiru. His spouse and half sister, Kishargal, held equal status. During his reign, Anshagal determined Nibiru's great solar circuit and named its length as a Shar. It was also during his reign that the laws of successorship were changed due in part to the fact his spouse was also his half-sister. Anshagal's firstborn son was technically with a concubine. When Kishagal later bore a son who was technically the legal heir, a succession crisis spawned. The result was the adoption of the Law of the Seed whereby a son by a half-sister, whenever born, will rise above all for succession. Kishagal's son, named Anshar, became heir to the throne and the fifth king of Nibiru. Anshar took his half-sister named Kishar as his spouse. Inki explains that it was during Anshar's reign when the Nibiruans discovered a breach in their atmosphere. Anshar and Kishar were unable to overcome the severe climate change and their son Inshar inherited the coming global disaster. Inshar spent several circuits around our solar system studying the atmospheres of Nibiru's planetary neighbors. Even so, he was unable to devise a solution for the atmospheric degradation and it grew worse. Inshar took his half-sister Ninshar as his spouse, but he did not ever produce a male heir. However, Inshar did have a firstborn son named Du'uru by a concubine. When he ascended to the throne as the seventh king, Du'uru bucked succession tradition and chose Da'uru, his childhood love, as his spouse. Da'uru was unable to bear a male heir, but she found a child at the palace gateway who was eventually adopted and decreed legal heir. His name was Lama. It is at this point in the planet's chronology that the Nibiruans decided on two courses of actions to resolve the atmospheric degradation. One of the suggestions was to fire missiles into the volcanoes in order to initiate eruptions that would in turn thicken the atmosphere. 
This approach did not work and left the Nibiruans with only one other course of action, the use of gold powder. But after four shars had passed and no gold was obtained, rebellion took root. A prince named Alelu took up arms against the king. Lama retreated to a tower in the palace where, after a brief struggle, he fell to his death. Alelu pronounced himself king. Alelu's accession to the throne created much consternation among the people, and he was summoned to the seven who judge. Alelu claimed to be the descendant of An Shagal, but he was challenged by a young prince named Anu, who claimed direct descendancy from An. Inki explains that Alelu offered a compromise to the succession crisis. Alelu proposed that he would remain seated on the throne and Anu would be next in line and that Anu's son would marry Alelu's daughter in order to ultimately unite succession. Alelu's proposal was successful. Alelu remained king for nearly nine complete shars during which the atmospheric environment of Nibiru grew ever worse. During the ninth shara, Anu challenged Alelu to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Anu won the competition and assumed kingship in the palace. Alelu escaped Nibiru in a celestial chariot and set his coordinates to Earth. The beginning of Tablet 2 describes Alelu's journey to Earth. Inki explains that as Alelu departed Nibiru, he observed the huge breach in its atmosphere. After traveling a great distance in dark space, Alelu was relieved when he spotted Little Gaga, also known as Pluto. After passing Little Gaga, Alelu encountered the outer planets one by one. First Antu, then came On, next came Anshar, and finally Kishar. After passing Kishar, Alelu reached the most treacherous part of his journey, the Hammered Bracelet, also known as the Asteroid Belt. After using missiles to clear a path, he completed his perilous flight through the belt. Soon thereafter, Alelu sped past Mars and arrived at Earth. Upon his arrival at Earth, Alelu conducted a planetary sensor sweep and determined gold was present in abundance. The narrative switches here to Inki's explanation of how the solar system formed and how Marduk, also known as Nibiru, was introduced to it. In the beginning, the Apsu, which is our sun, reigned alone in the void. Then it mingled the primordial waters and fashioned Tiamat. Little Mumu, which is Mercury, Lahamu, which is Venus, and Lamu, which is Mars. Meanwhile, in the outer region, Anshar, Kishar, An, and Antu were brought forth. At that time, Earth nor Nibiru inhabited the solar system. Inki describes how Tiamat formed 11 moons with Kingyu as the largest. Then the tablet explains the appearance of Nibiru as a huge rogue planet already carrying the seed of life. As Nibiru entered our solar system, Inki tells how the gravitational pull of Antu captured Nibiru and increased the rogue planet's size as well as sprouting four new moons. Next, Nibiru went past On and then approached Anshar. Inki explains how Anshar sent little Gaga as an emissary to Nibiru requesting vengeance on behalf of the other planets against Tiamat and her eleven warriors. Nibiru accepted the task in return for supreme command. The gods fashioned a princely circuit for Nibiru toward Tiamat and bestowed upon it weapons for the forthcoming battle. Inki describes that Nibiru went on to battle and ultimately split open Tiamat. After it rested the Tablets of Destinies from Kingyu, Nibiru left the moon bound to the remaining mass of the former Tiamat. When Nibiru encountered Tiamat the second time, it split Tiamat into two parts, and one part became the hammered bracelet that served as a firmament, and the other part became Earth, with King Yu bound to it. At this point, Tablet 2 returns to Alelu's narrative. Inki explains that Alelu was knowledgeable of the solar system formation along with the hammered bracelet. Once he landed on Earth, he determined the air was good, the water was drinkable, and there were fruit and fishes. After performing additional tests, Alelu determined gold was indeed present in the waters. Upon this confirmation, he sent a communication to Anu on Nibiru, informing him of his journey, the discovery of gold, and a demand to give heed to his conditions. Alelu's message from Earth astounded Anu and his counselors. They immediately verified the signal did not originate from Nibiru, and indeed had come from beyond the hammer bracelet. After Anu acknowledged Alelu's message, Alelu responded with a demand that he be pronounced king of Nibiru. Enlil, 
Anu's son with Antu, sharply contested Alelu's claims and requested proof of his account. Alelu transmitted his test samples and restated his demand for kingship. Ia, Anu's firstborn son who was married to Alelu's daughter, Damkina, offered to be an emissary for Anu and traveled to Earth in order to verify the claims and attempt reconciliation. He also suggested that a second wrestling should occur in order to decide kingship between Anu and Alelu. Despite Enlil's objection, Anu and Alelu agreed to Ia's journey to Earth. Ia prepared for his journey over the course of an entire shar. He departed Nibiru with 50 heroes and Anzu, the ship's commander. The group traveled past the five outer planets without much difficulty and arrived at the hammered bracelet. Unlike Alelu's use of atomic weapons to clear a path, Ia utilized a water thruster to move the asteroids from their path. However, their ship was also fueled by water and the trip through the hammered bracelet had depleted their supply. Thus, the group was required to land on Lamu to replenish their fuel. After a brief stopover, the group departed and soon thereafter arrived at Earth. After a careful approach through the atmosphere, Anzu splashed the ship down near the ocean's edge. After they landed, the group received a greeting from Alelu that enabled them to track his location. Their ship was able to transverse the water without difficulty, but once they reached marshlands, the heroes were required to don their fishes suits and exit the ship. They towed their ship with ropes to the edge of the marsh where they spotted Alelu along with his ship. As they came ashore, Alelu powerfully embraced Ia and welcomed them to Earth. After Iridu was established, Ia turned his attention to the acquisition of gold. The first attempt used a metal extraction technology to process the marsh waters for six days. They found iron and copper, but no gold. They repeated the process another week with the same results. Subsequently, after a full year, Ia decided to move the vessel into the deep ocean, and this action yielded better results, but still not the level of yield required by Nibiru. Ia assembled a sky chariot and appointed Abgal as its pilot. The two of them performed aerial surveys daily. The Nibiruans grew impatient and Anu ordered Ia to repair Alelu's ship and make it ready for a gold delivery during Nibiru's impending shar completion. Before repairing Alelu's ship, Ia and Abgal removed seven weapons of Terra and relocated them to a secret cave. When Ia directed Anzu to repair the ship, Anzu discovered the weapons were missing. Anzu objected to transferring the hammered bracelet without the weapons or water thrusters, but Ia reaffirmed the prohibition of the weapons. When Alelu agreed with Ia, Abgal volunteered to pilot the ship. Ia gave Abgal flight coordinates that directed him back through the pathway already cleared. After the ship departed, Nibiru was notified, which in turn caused much anticipation. After Anu welcomed Abgal home, the savants quickly removed the gold for processing into the finest dust. The Nibiruans spent an entire shar processing and testing the gold particulate before eventually dispersing it in the atmospheric breach. The endeavor seemed successful until Nibiru reached its apogee near the sun and the breach returned. Anu then ordered the return of Abgal to Earth along with Nungal and more heroes. However, even the, with the additional heroes and equipment, gold acquisition was underwhelming and Ia decided to resume aerial reconnaissance. He finally discovered the Abzu, southern Africa, where gold veins were abundant. Ia notified Anu that Earth indeed was filled with gold, but the large quantities were located deep in the landmass and not the waters. The assembly approved a mission to Earth led by Enlil and piloted by Alagar. After a warm welcome by Ia and not so much Alelu, Enlil assembled a new sky chamber. Once they reached the Abzu, Enlil confirmed quantities of unrefined gold concealed in what he called an admixture. It was decided that Anu should come to Earth to make the decisions. When he arrived on Earth, Anu received a royal welcome by his firstborn son Ia along with the heroes and their commander Enlil. Alelu was uncertain on what to do but Anu extended a greeting to him as well, and Alelu reluctantly accepted. After a day of celebration, Ia and Enlil briefed Anu on their findings, which in turn led Anu to view the Abzu for himself. Anu decreed that no matter the difficulty, the gold must be obtained. 
a council in Iridu was held in order to determine the logistics. When Ea suggested that he remain in Iridu to build more surrounding settlements in the region that he named Eden, Enlil angrily objected. Enlil argued that Eel was better suited to command the Abzu extraction efforts. Anu surprisingly decided that he, Ea, and Enlil would draw lots to determine the leaders of the Eden, Abzu, and Nibiru. The result was Anu retained the throne on Nibiru, Enlil was allotted Eden, and Eo was granted domain over the seas, oceans, and the lands beyond the Eden, including the Abzu. Additionally, Anu, perhaps in recompense for Ea losing Iridu, gave Ea the title Enki, meaning Earth Master. Alelu vehemently challenged Anu's decree. He reminded Anu that mastery of Earth was allotted to him originally, and that he also had not relaxed his claim of Nibiru's throne. Anu was angered and immediately challenged Alelu to a second wrestling. The two royals disrobed and began to grapple. After a mighty battle, Alelu fell to the ground with Anu's foot on his chest. Anu declared victory, but as he lifted his foot off of Alelu's chest, Alelu bit off Anu's male hood and swallowed it. When Enlil ordered his lieutenant to kill Alelu, Enki stepped in and ordered Alelu to be held prisoner. Before his departure, Anu demanded a judgment by seven judges as per Nibiru law. Alelu presented his chronology and pointed out how Anu had repeatedly broke his word. Although the majority of judges wanted Alelu put to death, Anu decided exile to Lamu would be Alelu's fate. The next day, Anu departed for his return to Nibiru by way of a stopover on Lamu. When they landed on Lamu, Anzu surprised Anu by declaring he wished to stay with Alelu on the planet. Anu declared that if Anzu survived until a way station was established on Lamu, he would become its commander. Once Anu returned to Nibiru, he set about the task of creating a network of way stations from Nibiru to Earth. Anu envisioned a constant caravan of chariots supplying gold from Earth. New ships were constructed and personnel received specialized training. The plans were sent to Inki and Enlil with an instruction to accelerate their acquisition efforts. Back on Earth, Inki calculated the logistics and designed the necessary equipment for extraction. Meanwhile, Enlil surveyed the Eden in an effort to establish a suitable landing place for the gold transports. In the north, among the snow-covered mountains and an immense cedar forest, Enlil identified the perfect location. Above a mountain valley, a surface was flattened and massive stones were quarried to construct the landing pad. This location is known today as Baalbek. On Nibiru, the construction of new ships continued according to Inki's design specification. Ninma, daughter to Anu and half-sister to Inki, was put in command of a fresh group of 50 heroes, including females specialized in healthcare. Ninma, along with her pilot Nangal, and the heroes departed Nibiru and arrived without difficulty at Lamu. On Lamu, Ninma encountered Anzu, who appeared dead. After an extreme effort, Ninma was able to revive Anzu and inquired about Alelu. Anzu explained that shortly after he and Alelu arrived on Lamu, Alelu experienced a gruesomely painful death as a result of his actions against Anu. Anzu led the group to a cave where Alelu was buried. Ninma and the group memorialized Alelu by carving his image in the mountain above the cave. Before departing for Earth, Ninma honored her father's promise and left behind 20 heroes to help Anzu construct the new way station with him in command. Upon her arrival in Iridu, Inki and Enlil warmly greeted their sister Ninma along with her group. From her chariot, they quickly unloaded the ships and equipment designed by Inki and all types of provisions. Nimma updated her brothers about events on Nibiru, Alelu's death, and Anzu's command of the new way station on Lamu. She explained that she had brought new seeds that would eventually grow a fruit which would provide an elixir to relieve their ailments. When Nimma described the ideal climate for the seeds, Enlil took her to his abode at the landing place. After they arrived, Nimma informed Enlil that their son Ninurta was ready to come to Earth. Enlil agreed if Ninma stayed as well. On the return to Iridu, Enlil gave Ninma an aerial tour of the Eden and explained his complex plans for the region, including his quarters in Larsa 
and its twin city of Lagash. He also planned a healing city named Shurabak to be led by Ninma and a mission headquarters named Nibruki, where the Tablets of Destinies would be housed. When Enlil divulged his intent to establish a sixth city for the purpose of directly transporting gold to Nibiru, Ninma admonished him to not transgress Anu's intent for the way station on Lamu. Meanwhile, in the Abzu, Inki was busy surveying the region for housing and mining locations. Over the next two shars, more personnel arrived from Nibiru, Enlil's planned cities were constructed, and the construction of the way station on Lamu continued to progress. At this point, Anu decided to address the heroes on Earth who numbered 600 and those on Lamu who numbered 300. He gave the 600 heroes of Earth the name Anunnaki and the 300 heroes of Lamu the name Egigi. The tablet narrative switches here to the backstory of Inki, Enlil, and Ninma. It explains that Ninma was mothered by a concubine and was half-sister to both Inki and Enlil. Anu had chosen for Inki to espouse Ninma, but she was attracted to Enlil instead and ended up bearing him a son named Ninurta. This angered Anu and caused him to forbid Ninma from future marriage. This caused Inki to espouse Damkina, who in turn bore him a son, an heir named Marduk. In contrast, the account of Enlil's marriage played out on Earth and not on Nibiru. One summer day, while Enlil was in retreat in the cedar forest, he became enchanted with a young girl named Sud bathing in a stream. He invited her to his cedar wood abode and subsequently raped her. Afterwards, Sud reported the incident to her commander, Ninma. As one might imagine, Ninma was furious on more than one level. The seven who judge banished Enlil from all the cities and exiled him to a land of no return. Abgal piloted Enlil to his place of exile, but then in a twist, Abgal explained that he had purposely chosen the location. Abgal explained this was the location where he and Inki had hidden the weapons of Terra and that Enlil could utilize them to gain his freedom. Back in the Eden, Sud had informed Ninma that she was pregnant with Enlil's child. This caused Inki and Ninma to pardon Enlil in order for him to return and marry Sud who was thereafter known as Ninlil. She bore Enlil a son and named him Nanar. He was the first of the Anunnaki conceived and born on Earth. After the Enlil rape debacle, Ninma decided to join Inki in the Abzu. The two of them tried twice to produce a male heir for Inki, but Ninma produced daughters instead. After Ninma returned to the Eden, Inki summoned Damkina and Marduk to Earth where his wife became known as Ninki. Inki had five more sons named Nergal, Gibel, Niningal, Ningizida, and Dumuzi. Meanwhile, Enlil and Ninma summoned Ninurta to Earth. Additionally, Enlil and Ninlil had another son named Ishkar. And thus, the two clans had formed, and a forthcoming rivalry was on the horizon. As the Anunnaki's time on Earth progressed, the gold extraction and transport to Nibiru continued with the result of its atmosphere being slowly repaired. The five cities of Eden were perfected with Inki in Iridu and Enlil in Nibruki, where he had erected a massive communications and observation tower. The tower also housed the Mies, which contained the secret formulas of the Sun, Moon, Nibiru, Earth, and the other eight planets. Discontent began to form within the ranks of the Anunnaki on Earth. The faster solar cycle on Earth affected their health, and they were granted access to only limited amounts of Nima's elixir. The Igigi on Lamu voiced even louder complaints. Anu directed Inki and Enlil to hold discussions with Anzu. While on Earth, Anzu decided to steal the Tablets of Destinies and attempt to gain control over the Anunnaki with his rebels located at the landing place. Upon learning of Anzu's treachery, Enlil contacted Anu, who in turn decreed Anzu to be seized and the tablets returned to the sanctuary. Ninurta, with the encouragement of his mother, volunteered to face Anzu. With the help of Inki and Enlil, Ninurta defeated Anzu in a spectacular aerial battle. Anzu was brought before the seven who judge and received a sentence of death. After Anzu was put to death, Marduk was ordered by Inki to return Anzu's body to Lamu and then assume command of the way station. 
After the failed rebellion, Enki and Enlil sought to avoid further unrest. Ninurta proposed the creation of a metal city, which was essentially a gold refinery that would allow for lighter cargoes and additional room for personnel exchanges from Earth to Nibiru. Over the course of three shars, the refinery named Bad Tibera was constructed with Ninurta as its first commander. However, an unintended consequence of the replenishment of laborers from Nibiru was that they were quicker to become restless. Enki was focused on other matters and did not perceive the resurging discontent. Enki had erected what he called the House of Life in the Abzu, where he became engrossed in intensive study. Ninurta was the first to notice the discontent in the Abzu when less gold ore began to arrive in Bad Tibera. Enlil dispatched Ninurta to the Abzu to investigate, whereupon Ninurta learned of the working conditions and informed Enki. They summoned Enlil to the Abzu, where he was housed near the excavation site. Subsequently, another rebellion took hold and the miners seized Enugi, the chief officer of mining. They then surrounded Enlil's dwelling using their tools as torches. When Enlil confronted the miners, they explained their distress. Enlil requested the release of Enugi, who then explained the extent of the toil. After Ninurta suggested that the rebels return to Nibiru, Enki summoned his son, Ningazita. After conferring with his son, Enki declared that they should create a primitive worker designated as the Lulu. Such a proposal astounded the leaders and they questioned the viability of such an endeavor. Then, Enki revealed the fact that such a creature already existed in the Abzu and simply required genetic manipulation to serve their purpose. Tablet 6 opens up with Enki's description of the creatures in the Abzu. He explains that the creatures use their forelegs as arms, do not wear garments, eat plants and drink water with their mouths, and have bodies covered in hair. When Enlil did not believe this, Enki led the leaders to the House of Life where he revealed the creatures captured in cages. Enki explained that the creatures could be genetically recombined with Nibiruan DNA in order to create a primitive worker that would relieve the Anunnaki of the toil in the Abzu. Enlil was hesitant and cited the fact that slavery had long been abolished on Nibiru. Enki and Ninma argued that the new beings would be merely helpers but Enlil continued his opposition. He said, To obtain gold was our purpose. To replace the father of all beginning it was not. As Nimma tried to further convince Enlil, her son Ninurta spoke in disagreement. Ningazita chimed in with his stated agreement of the proposed creation arguing that the endeavor was one of destiny. Enlil admitted that the decision was one of destiny versus fate, and the matter was referred to Anu and the council back on Nibiru. After a lengthy debate, the council decided from a mostly pragmatic view of survival that the being should be fashioned. Once approval was given, Inki and Ninma set about the work of genetic manipulation. Ningazita explained to Ninma the science of the life essence secrets and how two kinds could be combined. Inki explained to Nimma that her participation was necessary because she was familiar with the process of birth. At first, Nimma suggested that a male Anunnaki impregnate a two-legged female creature, but Inki informed her that such an experiment had already failed. Nimma's first true attempt was a successful artificial insemination of one of the female creatures, but when birth did not occur naturally, she performed a C-section. The offspring was not as they intended, as his hands were not suited for tools and his speech capability was limited to only grunts. On the second attempt, the outcome was better, but the child still could not hear and his eyesight was diminished. Inki and Ninma made several more attempts, all of them failures. Eventually, Inki decided an additive measure of the Abzu's clay should be involved in the process. This time they met with success and were overjoyed by their accomplishment. However, as time passed, the new offspring still could not process speech, so Inky went back to the drawing board. Inky surmised that complete success necessitated an Anunnaki womb instead of an earth creature womb. Nima volunteered to provide the Anunnaki womb. After a successful insemination, the small group wondered how long the pregnancy would take. Nine Nibiru months or nine earth months? 
As it turned out, it was in between the two. The tablet explains that the newborn was the image of perfection. Nimma gave the newborn the name Adamu, meaning one who like earth's clay is. After determining that the new offspring was a perfect model for the desired workers, Nimma summoned female healers from Shurabak, and seven of them volunteered to be birth mothers. Before the seven were inseminated, Nimma pronounced an incantation. To a unity shall the two essences, one of heaven, one of earth, together be brought, that which is of earth and that which is from Nibiru, by blood kinship be bonded. The seven children born were all male. When Ningazita suggested simply repeating the process to produce more workers, Inki pointed out that such a process required too much of the female healers. Inki declared that female earthlings should be fashioned as counterparts in order to procreate with the males. Inki nominated his wife Ninki to become the mold for the female earthling, and she accepted. Ninki was unable to give natural childbirth and required a C-section. The newborn female was named Tiamat, mother of life. They repeated the process with seven birth-giving heroines producing seven female earthlings. It was decided that Adamu and Tiamat were to be spared the toil of excavations in the Abzu and were brought to Iridu in the Eden for display to the other Anunnaki. Enlil, Ninurta, Ninlil, and Marduk all came to see them and were astounded. Inki, Nimma, and Ningazita returned to the Abzu in order to supervise the maturation of the primitive workers. As the circuits of earth grew in number, the maturity of the first workers became overdue and the Anunnaki were becoming impatient. After careful observation, Ningazita determined that although the new earthlings were mating, there was not successful conception. After performing some genetic tests, Ningazita determined only 22 pairs of chromosomes were present. As a solution, Ningazita extracted from Inki's rib his life essence and inserted it into the rib of Damu. He repeated the process with Nimma and Tiamat. Adamu and Tiamat were placed back in the Eden where they shortly thereafter became aware of their nakedness and began covering themselves. Enlil encountered Adamu and Tiamat in Eden and observed they were covering their loins. Enlil summoned Inki for an explanation. After Inki explained Ningazita's additional procedure, Enlil became outraged. Nimma and Ningazita were also summoned. Ningazita explained that although procreation was given to the primitive worker, the trait of long life was not. Enlil remained angry, expelling Adamu and Tiamat to the Abzu. Shortly after arriving in the Abzu, Tiamat became pregnant and gave birth to male and female twins. The maturation of Adamu's offspring was a marvel. Days were as months, months to earth years accumulated. The tablet explains that by the time they had more offspring, the first ones were already procreating. The new earthlings were very good workers who did not complain about the heat, dust, and backbreaking toil. The gold extraction efforts in the Abzu were productive, and Nibiru's atmosphere was slowly being repaired. It seemed that the Earth mission was successful. As time passed, the sons of Inki and Enlil took spouses and they bore Earth children. The children of the Anunnaki on Earth possessed quickened life cycles as compared to those on Nibiru. Eventually, Nanar and Ningal bore twins named Inanna and Utu. At this point, the tablet switches gears to the description of an upcoming natural catastrophe. The turmoil was not restricted to Earth. King Yu, Lemu, and even the hammered bracelet were experiencing havoc. Inki and Enlil contacted Anu for guidance. The savants back on Nibiru explained that Nibiru's circuit and the gravitational effects of its perturbance was the cause of the upheaval. After Nibiru passed, the havoc was calmed. After the calamity, Inki, Enlil, Marduk, and Ninurta surveyed the results. Although Inki determined the gold was still accessible on Earth, and Ninurta discovered the landing platform was intact, sulfuric mist and bitumens were widespread. The atmosphere on Lemu was also damaged, prompting Marduk's request to return to Earth. 
Enlil re-evaluated his original designs and concluded that a chariot place in the Eden must be established. The tablet states that 80 shars had passed since the first splashdown of Alelu. Regarding the new place of the chariots, Ninurta suggested it be built near Bad Tibera so that the gold could be directly transported to Nibiru bypassing Lamu. Enlil supported this suggestion and conveyed it to Anu back on Nibiru. But Inki pointed out that Earth's gravitational pull was greater than that of Lamu's and would be more difficult to overcome when lifting off. Inki suggested that he and Marduk survey the moon as a possible alternative way station and Anu agreed based on feedback from the savants. After surveying the moon, Inki and Marduk concluded it was unsuitable for a landing place, but Inki convinced Marduk that they should remain for a while and observe the celestial dance. They measured the durations of Earth months and years. They identified six celestials of the lower waters and six of the upper waters which were beyond the hammered bracelet. Inki designated three sets of twelve constellations named the Way of Anu, the Way of Enlil, and the Way of Inki. As Inki shared his observations with his son, Marduk was dismayed. He explained that he was upset his father chose Nimma and Ningazita to assist him in fashioning the primitive workers in the Abzu. Marduk was also very agitated by Enlil's legal heir status and the fact that Enlil inhabited Iridu while his father was in the Abzu. Essentially, Marduk questioned his destiny after they returned to Earth. Inki reassured his son that which his father had been deprived, Marduk's future lot shall be. Inki and Marduk had spent quite a long time on the moon. In the meantime, Enlil had been in contact with Anu to express his misgivings about Inki's absence. Enlil explained that Marduk had abandoned the way station on the moon and the Agigi were growing extremely impatient. He suggested that a new place of the chariots should be constructed in Eden near Bad Tibera and that Ninurta should be its commander. When Inki and Marduk returned from the moon and reported it was unsuitable for a way station, Anu declared that the place of the chariots be built. At that point, Inki argued for Marduk to be its commander, and this action immediately angered Enlil. Inki argued that it was no longer necessary for Marduk to command the Igigi and that he was well suited for the task at the place of the chariots. Anu, in an effort to calm the tensions, decreed that a third generation of Anunnaki on Earth should overtake command and appointed Utu for the task. He declared the city's name to be Sippar, meaning Bird City. Construction of Sippar was completed in one shar and Utu took command. Upon completion, Anu planned a visit to Earth. Marduk ordered the Igigi to Earth and Anunnaki from the landing place and the Abzu assembled for Anu's arrival. There was a great celebration after Anu reached Earth. Upon his departure, Anu declared that the Anunnaki mission on Earth would soon come to an end once enough gold was stockpiled for Nibiru's protection. After Anu departed Earth, Ninurta retained command of Bad Tibera, but Marduk did not return to Lamu, nor did he join Inki in the Abzu. Marduk basically decided to go on a road trip, or in this case a sky trip, around Earth. Utu was put in command of the remaining Agigi both on Earth and Lamu. While the Anunnaki in the Abzu were still complaining about the toil, the heroes in the Eden were even more discontent and in need of primitive workers. Inki and Enlil debated the matter, but Ninurta decided to act prematurely. He took 50 armed heroes to the Abzu in order to capture some earthlings and return to the Eden. Inki was angered that they were taken and Enlil was enraged that they were in the Eden. Enlil confronted Ninurta but allowed the primitive workers to remain in the Eden. Eventually the population growth of earthlings began to be a resource drain and Enlil demanded that Inki solve the problem. Inki conducted extensive research on the existing primitive worker population and discovered that with each new generation the species was devolving. Then one day while Inki was observing two female earthlings, he was enticed by them and subsequently impregnated them. He left his vizier Izamud to watch over the two women during their pregnancies. 
The two women gave birth on the same day in the 93rd Shar. One bore a male, the other a female. Enki instructed Izumud to keep the births secret and to claim the children were found among the bulrushes. Ninki raised the two children as her own, naming the male Adapa and the female Titi. Compared to earthling children, the two grew up slower but were much more intelligent. Inki notified Enlil that a new kind of earthling had appeared from the wilderness. Inki explained that the new earthlings were intelligent and suggested that they teach the new breed about farming and shepherding. Enlil was led to believe that the new breed naturally evolved on earth and subsequently agreed with Inki to enhance their knowledge. Eventually, Adapa mated with Titi, and she bore male twins. Once Anu was notified, he ordered Titi to remain in Iridu with the twins, but declared that Adapa be brought to Nibiru. Tablet 8 begins with Enlil's displeasure over the decision for Adapa to visit Nibiru. He was upset that Adapa would gain knowledge of space travel and have access to the food and drink of the Anunnaki. Inki shared in Lil's discontent, but Nimma reminded them that Anu's command could not be avoided. Inki suggested that they should use the command as an opportunity for Ningazita and Dumuzi to also visit Nibiru. Ilibrat, Anu's vizier, arrived on Earth to retrieve Adapa. Before his departure, Inki instructed Adapa on royal etiquette and also told him not to eat the bread nor drink the elixir because both would cause death. Inki also advised Dumuzi and Ningazita to not succumb to the delights of their homeworld, and he also gave Ningazita a tablet to give to Anu. Once they arrived on the Biru, they were washed, redressed, and anointed with perfumed oils, then taken to the throne room. From his throne, Anu stepped forward and embraced his grandsons. Then Ilibrat presented Adapa to the king. After confirming that Adapa could understand their speech, Anu ordered him to step forward and ask him his name and occupation. Adapa responded by giving his name and declaring he was a servant of Inki. Anu and his royal court were absolutely amazed and moved to the banquet room for a celebration. When Adapa refused to eat or drink, Anu became offended. Adapa explained that he was doing as Inki had instructed and Anu became perplexed. Ningazita handed Anu the hidden tablet and Anu retired to his private chamber to decipher it. In the message, Inki explained that although Adapa and Titi were of his seed, they were not endowed with the long life of the Nibiruans, and that is why Adapa was so instructed. Anu summoned Ilibrat to his chambers for advisement. Ilibrat pointed out that no rules existed for interplanetary cohabitation. He advised that Adapa should return to Earth, but Ningazita and Dumuzi should stay longer on the Biru. Anu summoned Ningazita to his chamber and asked him if he knew that what was in the message. Ningazita said he did not, but that he had a pretty good idea because he had tested Adapa's DNA and found it was matched to Inki. Anu made the decision to send both Adapa and Ningazita back to Earth. Adapa was destined to become civilized mankind's progenitor and Ningazita was instructed to become his teacher. Anu made an announcement to the royal court that the two would be returning to Earth, along with grains from Nibiru to cultivate. Dumuzi was ordered to stay on Nibiru for one shar. Once they arrived on Earth, Ningazita briefed Inki about Anu's reaction. Although he was elated that things went as expected, he was somewhat troubled about Dumuzi's detention on Nibiru. Enlil was more puzzled about Adapa's and Ningazita's prompt return to Earth and demanded that Inki and Ningazita explain what had transpired on the Biru. Inki requested that Ninma also be present and after she arrived, Ningazita explained everything including Inki's cohabitation with the Earthling females. Afterward, Inki declared that he had broken no rules, but Enlil sharply disagreed with Inki's actions. Marduk was summoned to Iridu by his mother Damkina. Marduk demanded an explanation of recent events, but Inki and Ningazita provided him only partial truth. He was impressed with Adapa and Titi, and he took a liking to their offspring. Marduk requested that he become the teacher of the two boys. Enlil commanded that Marduk would be the teacher of one, and that Ninurta be the teacher of the other. Ningazita remained in Iridu with Adapa and Titi and began their education. Ninurta named the firstborn of the twin boys Cain and took him to Bad Tibera, 
where he taught him to dig canals and till the land for sowing and reaping crops. The other brother was taken to the meadows by Marduk, where he was instructed in the ways of shepherding. He was thereafter known as Abel. After one shar had passed, Dumuzi returned to earth with the essence seed of sheep and ewes and delivered them to Inki. In contemplating what course to take with the four-legged animals from Nibiru, it was decided that a house of fashioning should be established at the landing place in the Cedar Mountains. Thus began the multiplying of grains and ewes. After the first crops were reaped and the first sheep matured, Enlil proclaimed a celebration of first. Both Cain and Abel placed their offerings at the feet of Enki and Enlil. Enlil gave a joyful blessing to both brothers, but Enki seemed impressed only with Abel. Cain was greatly aggrieved by this and further offended by Abel's boasting. While Abel bragged that the Anunnaki were more impressed with his efforts, Cain argued that it was his fields that made the birds multiply and his canals where the fish were abundant. The two brothers continued to argue throughout the entire winter. Once summer arrived, a drought caused the meadows to dry and pastures to dwindle. Cain drove his flocks into Abel's fields and this ultimately caused a physical confrontation between the two. During the altercation, Cain repeatedly struck Abel in the head with a stone. When Cain saw Abel's blood gushing, he realized that he had killed his brother. Titi had a premonition of the killing and informed Adapa. The two set out for Iridu to find the twins. Eventually, they found Cain sitting next to his dead brother. Once Adapa returned to Iridu, he informed Inki of what had transpired, causing Inki to become furious. Inki banished Cain from the Eden and ordered the Anunnaki custom of burial to be carried out with Abel's body. Cain was brought to Iridu for judgment where Inki planned to pronounce his sentence of exile, but Marduk demanded that Cain be sentenced to death. Ninurta argued that the matter should be put before the seven who judge. This suggestion greatly angered Marduk, but Inki spoke to him privately and advised him that they should not compound the agony. Inki explained to Marduk the whole truth about Cain and Abel's bloodline and that executing Cain would threaten what had been achieved thus far. Inki appealed to his son to let the line of Adapa to survive and Marduk agreed. It was pronounced, quote, eastward to a land of wandering for his evil deed Cain must depart, that his life must be spared, he and his generations shall be distinguished, end quote. With his sister slash spouse, Awan, Cain departed the Eden to set out to the land of wandering. After the death of Abel and the expulsion of Cain, the Anunnaki decided that Adapa and Titi needed to bear more offspring in order to take their place. After bearing many daughters, in the 95th Shar they finally gave birth to a son named Sati, meaning he who life binds. In all, Adapa and Titi bore 30 sons and 30 daughters. In the 97th Shar, Sati and his spouse Azura had a son named Inchi, meaning Master of Humanity. He was taught the secrets of the Anunnaki by Adapa, Nanar, and Ishkar. Inchi espoused his sister Nome, who bore a son named Kunin. In Bad Tibera, he was tutored in the operation and use of the furnace and kiln. He learned how to use bitumens to make fire and how to smelt and refine metal. In the 99th Shar, Kunin had a son with his half-sister Mulet and named him Malalu, meaning he who plays. In the 100th Shar, Malalu and his spouse Duna had a son named Irid, meaning he of sweet waters. Dumuzi taught Irid how to dig wells in the meadows to provide water to the flocks. At the end of the 102nd Shar, Irid and his spouse Baraka had a son named Inkimi, to whom Inki took a liking and mentored. Inkimi was intensely educated on celestial matters and was eager to explore the heavens. Inkimi was sent to meet with Marduk at the landing place and departed from there on a trip to the moon. When Inkimi returned to Earth, he was sent to the place of the chariots in Sipper to be with Utu. Inkimi was installed as a prince of earthlings and taught the functions of priesthood. In the 104th Shar, Inkimi and his spouse, Edini, had a son named Methusel, meaning who by the bright waters raised. After the birth of his son, Inkimi went on his second journey to the heavens with Marduk. This time they visited the Igigi on Lemu. The tablet explains that Inkimi spent the rest of his days in the heavens making a record of all that he had learned. 
He passed this record down to his sons, Methusel, Raghum, and Gadad to study and abide by. Methusel and his spouse Ednot had a son named Lamach, meaning mighty man. During Lamach's time, things had become much harsher in the fields and meadows. It was also during this time that Adapa's death approached. Adapa requested that all of his sons and the sons of his sons assemble themselves before him. When everyone had gathered, Adapa noticed his firstborn son Cain was absent and requested for him to be fetched. Sati asked Lord Inki what should be done and in turn Inki summoned Ninurta to bring Cain to Adapa's deathbed. When Cain arrived, Adapa requested for he and Sati to come before him. Adapa put his right hand on the head of Sati and said, quote, Of your seed shall the earth be filled, and of your seed as a tree with three branches mankind a great calamity shall survive. End quote. He then put his left hand on the head of Cain and said, quote, For your sin of your birthright you are deprived, but of your seed seven nations shall come. In a realm set apart they shall survive. Distant lands they shall inhabit, but having your brother with a stone killed, by a stone will be your end." end quote. After Adapa died, his body was wrapped in cloth and buried in a cave by the banks of the river. Adapa had been born in the middle of the 93rd Shar and died by the end of the 108th. After his father's death, Cain returned to the land of wandering, where he began building a city for his sons and daughters. As he was building, by a falling stone, he was killed. During the days of Lumak, the hardships on Earth were increasing. Likewise, Lamu was becoming a dry and dusty planet. Enlil, Inki, and Ninma met to determine what was causing the conditions on Earth and Lamu. In the Abzu, they installed observatory instruments, and Nergal and his spouse Irish Kegel were put in charge. Ninurta was assigned to establish a bond heaven-earth in the mountain land. Marduk was given the task of pacifying the Agigi on Lamu. During their meeting, Inki and Enlil and Ninma reflected on how much they had aged over the last 100 plus shars. They considered if it were time for them to return to Nibiru as they had planned many times before. They wondered what it was exactly that made them age so much while on earth. Ultimately, they decided to stay and see what transpired. It came to pass soon thereafter Marduk came to his father, Inki, and expressed his desire to choose a bride. When Marduk revealed that he desired to marry a descendant of Adapa, Inki was astounded he had chosen an earthling. Marduk pointed out that technically he was not an earthling, but his own offspring, a daughter of Inki Mi, named Sarpanit. Inki summoned Ninki, and Marduk restated his desire to his mother. Ninki asked Marduk if Sarpanit appreciated his affection, and he answered in the affirmative. Inki was more concerned with the fact that Marduk would forsake his princely rights on Nibiru with such an act. Marduk bitterly responded by stating that his rights on Nibiru were non-existent, and that even on Earth his rights as firstborn had been trampled. His parents were in agreement. Inki and Ninki summoned Methusel and informed him of Marduk's desire to marry his sister. Methusel was humbled and overjoyed at the same time. On the contrary, when Enlil was told of the decision, he was consumed with fury, and Ninma was greatly disappointed. Enlil contacted Anu and conveyed his contempt for Marduk's decision. Anu's counselors determined, as much as was the case with Inki, there were no rules governing this course of action. After conferring with the savants, Anu decided that he could marry Sarpanit, but he would lose his title of prince on Nibiru and could never return. Inki, Marduk, and even Enlil accepted Anu's decision, but when Ninki proposed the wedding occur in Iridu, Enlil announced that Marduk could not stay in the Eden afterward. Inki suggested to Enlil to give Marduk and his wife a domain of their own above the Abzu in what eventually became known as Egypt and Enlil agreed. A great multitude of earthlings assembled in Iridu for the wedding ceremony. Even 200 Agigi from Lemu showed up, but they were not really there for the party as it turns out. The leaders of Earth did not realize the true intent of the Agigi was to abduct and conjugate with the female earthlings. 
discontent had been brewing among the Igigi on Lemu for a long time, and when Marduk was given permission to marry an earthling, they decided it was time for action. One named Shamgaz had become sort of their union leader, and they wanted equal rights to marry and have children. Once the ceremony concluded, Shamgaz gave a prearranged signal and each one of the Igigi abducted an earth female and returned to the landing place where they established a stronghold. When Marduk was urged to retake charge of the Igigi, he admitted that he agreed with their position. While Inki and Ninma begrudgingly agreed, Enlil was absolutely enraged. He said, quote, One evil deed by another has been followed. Fornication from Inki and Marduk the Igigi have adopted. Our pride and sacred mission to the winds have been abandoned. By our own hands, this planet with earthling multitudes shall be overrun. End quote. Enlil ordered the Igigi and their females back to Lemu, but Marduk informed him that survival on Mars was no longer possible. Enlil then declared that they could not stay in the Eden and left the gathering in disgust. It was at this point in time that Enlil began plotting against Marduk and the Earthlings. The Agigi and their females became secluded in the Cedar Mountains where they bore children who became known as the children of the rocket ships. Marduk and Sarpanet also had children, and the first two sons were named Ashar and Satu. Marduk had built two cities for his sons and invited the Igigi to come live in his domain. Some of the Igigi took Marduk's invitation and others stayed at the landing platform, including Shamgaz. Ninurta had been observing Marduk's moves and asked his father Enlil what was Marduk's scheme. Enlil warned that the earth would be inherited by the earthlings. Enlil instructed Ninurta to find the offspring of Cain and to prepare his own domain. Once Ninurta located Cain's offspring on the other side of the world, he taught them how to make tools and engage in mining and smelting. He taught them how to build seaworthy rafts and guided them to a new land where they established a city with twin towers. Back in the Eden, Lumok and his wife Badanash were enforcing the work quotas and ration reductions of the earthlings. Badanash was an outstanding beauty and Inky basically had a crush on her. Inky had Marduk summon Lumok to his domain. While Lumok was away, Inky had Badanash brought to Ninma's house in Shurabak, where he soon after showed up and subsequently impregnated her. Lumok was summoned back to the Eden upon the news of him having a new son. He immediately counseled with his father Methusel about the odd appearance of his so-called son. Methusel demanded an answer from Badanash as he suspected the father to be one of the Agigi. She denied that the offspring was one of an Agigi, and Methusel consoled Lumok, saying that the boy was an omen with a unique destiny. He explained that Lumok's son was a sign that respite was coming to those of Earth, and he should so be named. The boy was named Susudra, meaning he of long bright life days, and was raised in Shurabak. Both Ninma and Inki greatly adored the child, teaching him the writings of Adapa and priestly rites. Once Susudra was grown, he married Imzara, and they had three sons. During this time, the sufferings on earth intensified. As a result of the actions of the Agigi and Marduk, Enlil was greatly disturbed and distraught. He believed that the Anunnaki mission to earth had become perverted, causing plagues and pestilence. Both Inki and Ninma suggested that they teach the earthlings healing and canal building, but Enlil forbade them from doing so. For over three shars, the earthlings continued to suffer. Eventually, the celestial anomalies caused even the Anunnaki to become concerned about their own rations and well-being. It was determined that the creator of all was angry and was returning the heavens to the primordial days which would cause a great deluge on Earth. It was decided that both Earth and Lemu would be evacuated. A fleet of fast celestial chariots was dispatched to Earth from Nibiru. Aboard one of the ships was a white-haired Anunnaki named Galzu, meaning Great Knower. Galzu was the messenger of Anu and summoned all to Nibruki, including Inki and Ninma, once he arrived on Earth. He explained that they had studied the health of those Anunnaki who had returned to Nibiru, and that the adverse effects would result in death if they tried to go home. Thus, Galzu conveyed a secret command to Inki, Ninma, and Enlil that they were to wait out the calamity in orbit above Earth. 
the rest of the Anunnaki could decide whether they wanted to stay in orbit or to go to Nibiru. Furthermore, the Igigi that espoused Earthlings were not allowed to go to Nibiru. An exception was made for Marduk, but not Sarpanit. Enlil summoned the Council of Anunnaki and Igigi to Nibruki and informed them of Galzu's instructions. Ninurta and Ishkur announced they would stay with their father Enlil. Nanner, Inki's firstborn, expressed a desire to wait it out on the moon, and a puzzled Inki and Enlil agreed. Nanner's children, Utu and Inanna, announced they would stay in orbit. Marduk defiantly pronounced he would stay with Sarpanit and the Igigi. Inki's other children, Nergal, Gibble, Ningal, Ningazida, and Dumuzi, all declared their intent to wait it out in orbit. And finally, Nimma announced with pride her choice to stay and not abandon the earthlings she helped create. Enlil angrily proclaimed that the earth abominations should perish. Inki shouted in response that the being created by them must be saved. Enlil unloaded on Inki saying, quote, From the very beginning at every turn the decisions by you modified were, to primitive workers procreating you gave, to them knowing you endowed. The powers of the creator of all into your hands you have taken. Thereafter, even that by abominations you fouled. With fornication a dappa you conceived, understanding to his line you gave. His offspring to the heavens you have taken, our wisdom with them you shared. Every rule you have broken, decisions and command you ignored. Because of you, by a civilized earthling brother, a brother murdered. Because of Marduk, your son, the Igigi, like him, with earthlings intermarried. Who is lordly from Nibiru, to whom the earth alone belongs? To no one is no longer known. Enough, enough to all that I say. The abominations cannot continue. Now that a calamity by a destiny unknown has been ordained, let what must happen, happen. End quote. Enlil then demanded all those present to solemnly swear an oath of secrecy. Enlil's side quickly acknowledged, followed slowly by Inki's side. When it came to Inki, he asked Enlil why he even bothered to ask for such an oath because there was apparently nothing he could do to stop the forthcoming events anyway. Then he left the assembly with Marduk in tow. Upon their departure, Enlil explained the logistics of the evacuation plan once those headed for Nibiru had left, Marduk and the Igigi with earthling wives gathered at the landing place where Marduk gave them the chance to either go to Lamu or to the distant mountain lands of Earth. Enlil assigned Ninurta to the mountain lands beyond the oceans. Nergal and Irish Kigal were sent to report from the White Land and Ishkir was tasked with barring access by the earthlings to Sipper. Enlil also moved the Tablet of Destinies from Nibruki to Sipper. As the group awaited the approach of Nibiru, which would in turn trigger the calamity, they all grew apprehensive. During this period, Inki explained to his sister Ninma that Enlil's anger with the Earthlings had caused him to ignore the other living creatures on the planet. He suggested that they should preserve their seed of life for safekeeping, and she agreed. Ningazita aided Inki in collecting the essences and life eggs of the indigenous animals two by two. Soon thereafter, Ninurta, Nergal, and Irish Kegel announced the deluge was upon them. Tablet 10 opens up with Inki having a dream vision shortly before the day of the deluge. He saw the image of a bright and shining man who turned out to be Galzu. He held in one hand a stylus and in the other a tablet of lapis lazuli. Galzu then spoke. Unwarranted your accusations against Enlil were, for only the truth he spoke, and the decision that as Enlil's decision will be known, not he, but destiny decreed. Now into your hands fate take, for the earthlings the earth will inherit. Summon your son Sisudra without breaking the oath to him, the coming calamity reveal. A boat that the watery avalanche can withstand, a submersible one, to build him tell the likes of which on this tablet to you I am showing. Let him in it save himself and his kinfolk and the seed of all that is useful, be it plant or animal, also take. That is the will of the creator of all. After speaking, Galzu drew an image on the tablet and laid it by Inki before it faded away. Inki awoke and for a while pondered the meaning of the vision. 
As he got out of bed, Inky noticed the tablet was actually there. He picked it up and saw the image of a curious shaped boat and its measurements. Inky quickly sent his emissaries to find the one called Galzu. They returned at the end of the day to inform Inky that Galzu had long ago left Earth to go back to Nibiru. That night, Inky visited Susudra and spoke to him through the hut wall as to not break his oath. Inky proceeded to instruct Susudra to abandon his house, build a boat, and spurn his possessions. He told Susudra to follow the measurements on the tablet which he left for him. He was given seven days for construction at which time he was to gather his family, kinfolk, food, drinking water, and household animals. Inky then let Susudra know that a signal would be given on the appointed day and that a boat guide would also show up. Inky told Susudra that by him shall the seed of civilized mankind survive. After Inky left, Susudra went outside and found the tablet. As instructed by Inky, the next day Susudra announced to the townspeople that he must leave the Eden and sail to the Abzu as a result of Enlil's anger toward him. As a result, the townspeople were eager to help Susudra build the boat and stock it in order to get him on his way as quickly as possible. On the sixth day, Inky's son Ninagal, Lord of the Great Waters, showed up to navigate the boat. Ninagal carried with him a cedar box containing the life essences and life eggs of living creatures that Inky and Nimma previously collected. Finally, the day of the deluge arrived and Ninagal ordered the watertight hatches sealed. The tablet explains that the Antarctic ice sheet was ripped from its foundation by the gravitational pull of Nibiru and formed a tidal wave that reached the sky. When the wave reached Shurabak, Susudra's boat was submerged but held firm without a drip of water entering inside. The Anunnaki in Earth orbit watched as the devastation took place. Nimma cried out, My created like drowned dragonflies in a pond the waters fill. All life by the rolling sea wave away was taken. Inanna cried out, Everything down below, all that lived, has turned into clay. After the initial destruction of the deluge, it continued to rain for forty more days and nights. All that was living on dry lands had perished. After forty days, the rain stopped and Susudra opened the boat hatch to determine their location. Then Ninagal directed the boat toward the twin peaks of Arata. Susudra was impatient and released some birds to scout for dry land. Eventually, a dove returned with a twig giving Susudra knowledge of the reemergence of dry land. A few days later, the boat landed at the Mount of Salvation. Susudra and his group built an altar on the peak of Arata and sacrificed lamb to Inki. In Earth orbit, Enlil suggested that he and Inki descend to the peak of Arata to review the situation. When they arrived, Enlil was puzzled by the whiffs of fire and roasting meat. Once they spotted Susudra and Ninagal, Enlil lost it. He lunged toward Inki, shouting that every earthling had to perish. Enlil was ready to kill Inki, but Inki pointed out that Susudra was not technically a mortal earthling. In the meantime, Ninagal had contacted Ninurta and Ninma, who descended to the peak as well. Unlike Enlil, they were not angered by the events, and Ninma swore, on my oath, the annihilation of mankind shall never be repeated. Enlil eventually relented and ended up blessing Susudra and his spouse Imzara, telling them to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. As the floodwaters receded, the Anunnaki surveyed the landscapes. Everything that had existed in the olden times was now covered in a deep layer of mud. Iridu, Nibruki, Shurabak, and Sipper were all gone, but the landing place in the Cedar Mountains was still standing. After clearing the debris, the Anunnaki used it to land their ships. Soon thereafter, Marduk on Lamu and Nanner on the moon were notified. Enlil gathered the Anunnaki and Agigi and called them to assembly. He explained that the earth was basically devastated and that they must assess recovery efforts. Marduk informed them that Lamu's atmosphere had been sucked away and the waters had evaporated. Enlil explained to everyone that they were now solely focused on their survival and that they should check the creation chamber for Nibiru's grain seeds. They found the diorite chest intact and the seeds inside were still viable. Enlil gave the seeds to Ninurta and instructed him to plant them on the mountainside terraces. Then Enlil assigned Ishkur to find any surviving fruit-bearing trees, which he did. It was at this point that Inki revealed the chest that Ninagal had carried. 
He explained how it would help replenish the earth's living creatures and assigned Dumuzi the task of shepherding new sheep and cattle. In the Abzu, Enki assigned Ninigal to dam the waterfalls and create a lake. Then Enki, along with Marduk, surveyed the lands between the Abzu and the Great Sea and subsequently raised a valley from under the waters. Enki proudly conveyed their progress to Nibiru, but the news on Nibiru was not good. The close passage of Earth and Lamu to Nibiru had caused the gold shield to be torn. New supplies of gold were desperately needed. Enki and Gibble immediately went to survey the gold mines in the Abzu, which had been buried. In addition, Bad Tibera and Sipper no longer existed along with their workforces. Enlil and Enki alerted Nibiru that it was currently impossible to provide any gold. Meanwhile, Ninurta had finished his task in the Cedar Mountains and journeyed to the other side of the earth. There he found that the avalanche of waters had cut deep into the mountainsides and exposed deep veins of gold. Enlil and Enki quickly traveled to Ninurta and discovered that indeed, pure gold that did not require refinement was plentiful. They then contemplated how to collect the gold and transport it to Nibiru. Ninurta was able to solve the first problem by disclosing that in this part of the world some earthlings had survived the Great Deluge. They were the descendants of Cain, and they already possessed skills in metallurgy. They then turned their attention to establishing a new place for celestial chariots. Subsequently, they found a desolate peninsula suitable for the purpose. Enlil suggested that the landing place in the Cedar Mountains should also be part of the facilities. The distance between the landing place and the chariot place Enlil measured, and in the midst thereof a place for a new mission control center was designated. The Mount of the Way showing he named it. Enlil required two more sets of twin peaks to demarcate the landing corridor. In the southern part of the desolate peninsula, a place of mountains, Enlil selected twin adjoining peaks for the southern delimit. But there were no mountains where the remaining set of twin peaks was required. Ningus Zeta suggested that they create artificial peaks at that location. Enlil gave his approval and declared that the artificial peaks should also serve as beacons. Ningus Zeta first built a scale model and then constructed the two great pyramids of Giza, which included chambers for pulsating crystals. Upon completion, the leaders were invited to witness the placing of the capstone, which was fashioned by Gibble out of Electrum. The Anunnaki leaders named the great twin peak Eker meaning house which like a mountain is. At that point, Enlil activated the Nibiru crystals, which caused the capstone to shine brighter than the sun. Ninma was moved by the occasion and recited a poem. House that is like a mountain, house with a pointed peak. For heaven and earth it is equipped, the handiwork of the Anunnaki it is. House bright and dark, house of heaven and earth. For the celestial boats it was put together, by the Anunnaki built. House whose interior with a reddish light of heaven glows, a pulsating beam that far and high reaches it emits. Lofty mountain of mountains, great and lofty fashioned, beyond the understanding of earthlings it is. House of equipment, lofty house of eternity, its foundation stones the waters touch, its great circumference in clay is set. House whose parts are skillfully together woven. The great ones who in the skies circle to a resting make descent. House that for the rocket ships is a landmark with unfathomable insides. By Anu himself is the Ecker blessed. During the celebration, Inki suggested to Enlil that a monument be created beside the pyramids which announced the age of the lion and possessed the image of Ningazita, their designer. When Enlil consented, Enki said, Of the place of the celestial chariots, Utu must again the commander be. Let the gazing lion, precisely eastward facing, with Ningazita's image, be. During the construction of the Sphinx, Marduk conveyed his aggrievement to his father Enki. To dominate the whole earth to me did you promise. Now command and glory to others are granted. Without task or dominion I am left. In my earth's wild domain are the artifice mounts situated. On the lion, the image mine must be. Marduk basically pissed off everyone with his comment, and they all started demanding their own domains and devoted earthlings. Ninma stepped in to preserve the peace by offering compromise. Enlil declared that the habitable lands should be divided between them. 
Ninma received the peninsula which was named Tilmun, land of the missiles. The habitable lands to the east were assigned to Enlil, his offspring and also the descendants of the two sons of Susudra, Shem and Yafet. The Abzu was assigned to Enki and his clan, including the peoples of Susudra's middle son, Ham. To appease Marduk, he was made master of their lands. In the mountainous south of Tilmun, Ninurta built an abode for Ninma. Once gold shipments resumed to Nibiru, Enki and Enlil agreed to give Ninma a new epithet, Ninharzag, meaning Mistress of the Mountainhead. Over the course of the first Shar after the Great Deluge, Ninharzag managed to cool tensions between the clans, but as the earth had slowly recovered from the devastation, new rivalries formed. While Marduk and his family were on the move waiting out the deluge, his two sons, Asar and Satu, became involved with the daughters of Shamgaz, the Agigi leader. Upon their return to earth, Asar married Asta, and Satu married Nabat. Asar lived with his father Marduk in the Abzu, and Satu lived with Shamgaz at the landing place. Shamgaz began inciting the Igigi to ask about their place in the pecking order. Shamgaz and Nabat taunted Satu daily by telling him that Asar would be the lone successor and heir to the fertile lands. After scheming to retain succession solely for Satu, they invited the Igigi and Anunnaki to a banquet. The unsuspecting Asar came to the celebration. Shamgaz and Nabat overindulged Asar with food and spiked wine. After Asar passed out, they placed him in a coffin and threw it into the sea. When Asta learned of what had happened, she immediately informed Marduk and they began a search for the coffin. By the shores of the dark-hued land, it was found with Asar's lifeless body in it. As his mother Sarpanet wept, Enki reflected how the curse of Cain had been repeated. Asta declared that Satu must die and that she would conceive a new heir for Marduk. Enki said no to that idea quickly and stated, The brother who killed the brother's brother must be the keeper. For this Satu must be spared. By his seed and heir to Asar you must conceive. Asta was determined to defy Enki. Before Asar was preserved for enshrinement, she extracted semen from his body and artificially inseminated herself. Shortly thereafter, Satu declared to Enki and Marduk that he was sole heir and successor to Marduk and that he will be the master of the two Neros. Asta refuted Satu's claim to the Anunnaki council by revealing that she was with child, Asar's heir. After her son Horon was born, Asta hid out in the river's bulrushes to avoid Satu, but ultimately Shamgaz and Satu were not very concerned with Asta's claim. As time passed, the Igigi had spread all the way to the borders of Tilmun, in Harzag's sacred region. In the meantime, Horon had grown into a hero after being adopted and trained by his great-uncle Gibble. Gibble fashioned winged sandals that enabled Horon to fly like a falcon and he made him a divine harpoon that shot missiles. He taught him how to make and fashion iron in order to produce weapons for his newly raised earthling army. Once ready, Horon with his army proceeded north to the border of Tilmun, where Satu challenged him to one-on-one -on -one combat. Satu approached the battlefield in his ship and Horon soared toward him like a falcon. Satu shot Horon with a poisoned dart and it immediately disabled him. Upon seeing this, Asta cried out to Ningazita, who promptly came down to treat Horon. By the next morning, Horon had returned from the dead. Ningazita provided him with some sort of craft that resembled a fiery pillar, which he promptly used to re-engage Satu in battle. After a fierce fight, Horon smote Satu with his harpoon and bound him in tethers. Horon brought his uncle to the Igigi council where they decided to let the blinded and castrated Satu live based on Astra's suggestion. The council then declared Horon heir to his father's throne. Marduk was pleased with the decision but still had misgivings about Horon because he was descended from Shamgaz the Igigi. Although Marduk and Sarpanet had lost both their sons, in time they bore another son named Nabu, meaning prophecy bearer. After the battle between Satu and Horon, Enlil summoned his three sons to council. Enlil gave them the following warning. In the beginning, the earthlings in our image and after our likeness we made. Now the Anunnaki offspring in the image and likeness of the earthlings became. 
Then it was Cain who his brother killed. Now a son of Marduk is his brother's killer. For the first time, an Anunnaki offspring from earthlings an army raised. Weapons from a metal of the Anunnaki a secret in their hands he placed. From the days when by Alelu and Anzu our legitimacy was challenged, disruption and rule-breaking by the Igigi continued. Now the beacon peaks in the domain of Marduk are located. The landing place by the Igigi is held. Now toward the place of the chariots the Igigi are advancing. In the name of Satu to all the heaven earth facilities they claim will lay. Enlil went on to propose that counter steps should be taken. He explained that they should establish their own secret launch facility in Ninurta's realm and entrusted Ninurta with the task. Meanwhile, Dumuzi, Inki's youngest son, fell in love with Inanna, Nanar's daughter and Enlil's granddaughter. Inki allotted to Dumuzi a large domain named Miluha, above the Abzu. Dumuzi had become Inki's favorite after Asar's death, and Marduk was jealous. Eventually, Dumuzi and Inanna wanted to get married, and first went to Ningal, Inanna's mother, to inform her. Ningal gave her blessing and Inanna's brother Utu agreed. Even Enlil acquiesced, hoping that their marriage would bring peace among the clans, and Inki agreed for the same reason. Basically, everyone was in agreement except Marduk. During the espousal ritual, just Inanna, Dumuzi's sister, was sent to help Inanna prepare when Inanna confided her plans to rule through Dumuzi. Jestinana immediately alerted Marduk to what she had heard from Inanna, and he developed a secret plan for her to employ. Jestinana visited Dumuzi and explained that before he was to be with Inanna, that a legitimate heir could only be born by a sister. Dumuzi proceeded to impregnate his sister and then fell asleep. After having a premonition of death in a dream, Dumuzi awoke and told Jestinana. She added to Dumuzi's fear by telling him that Marduk will accuse him of raping her and that Marduk would prevent him from marrying Inanna. Dumuzi became distraught and rushed out through the desert of Emush. He eventually reached a place of mighty waterfalls where he slipped and fell to his death. Ninengal retrieved Dumuzi's body and brought it to the abode of Nergal in Irish Kigal, in the lower Abzu. When Inki heard of Dumuzi's death, he questioned why water figured into his life so much. When I to earth from Nibiru came, Ia, he whose home is waters, was my name. With waters did the celestial chariots obtain their thrust power. In waters I splashed down. Then by an avalanche of waters the earth was swept over. In waters did Asar, my grandchild, drown. By waters my beloved Dumuzi is now dead. Everything I had done, for the righteous purpose did I do it. Why am I punished? Why has fate against me turned? Once Inanna learned of Dumuzi's death, she hurried to the lower Abzu to retrieve Dumuzi's body for burial. When she arrived, Inanna's sister, Irish Kegel, suspected that she was scheming against her. Irish Kegel removed Inanna's weapons as she passed through seven gates, and Inanna arrived at the throne unclothed and powerless. Irish Kegel ordered her vizier, Namtar, to let loose the sixty diseases against Inanna. After Nanar became worried, she contacted Enlil, who in turn contacted Inki to find out what had happened to Inanna. After Inki learned from Nergal what had happened, he fashioned two emissaries from clay who were beings without blood. He ordered them to bring back Inanna alive or dead. When the two emissaries reached Irish Kegel, Namtar attempted to use magical weapons against them, but they were unharmed. He relented and took them to Inanna's lifeless body hanging from a stake. After directing a pulser and an emitter upon the corpse and then sprinkling the water of life and placing the plant of life in her mouth, Inanna's eyes opened and she arose from the dead. Inanna ordered the two emissaries to take along Dumuzi's body with them when they returned to the upper world. Once back at Dumuzi's house, Inanna ordered the emissaries to wash, anoint, and shroud his body to await the day of arising. Meanwhile, Inanna went to Inki to demand the death of Marduk. After Inki declined to punish Marduk, she went to her parents and brother. Inanna and Utu went to Enlil's abode where they gathered a council of war with help from Enlil's sons. They agreed that Earth should be rid of Marduk and demanded Inki to surrender him. Upon receiving the demand, Inki summoned Marduk and all the other sons to his abode. He explained that although he still grieved for Dumuzi, 
he had to defend Marduk's succession. Gibal and Ninagal heeded Enki's call, but Nergal and Ningazita were hesitant. Shortly thereafter, a ferocious war erupted between the clans. Inanna initiated the war by flying her skyship into the domains of Enki's sons and challenging Marduk to battle. Ninurta assisted her in his storm bird and shot withering beams at their strongholds. Ishkur also attacked with scorching lightnings and smashing thunders. Marduk retreated north to the Great Pyramid with Ninurta in pursuit. By the time Inanna reached Giza, Gibble had set up a shield around the pyramid. Inanna directed a weapon of brilliance at the Artificed Mountain. Horon tried to defend his grandfather, but Inanna damaged his right eye. Even so, her weapons could not breach the pyramid. Ninurta found a secret entrance during the battle and entered the Grand Gallery. When Marduk received the intruder alert, he readied his weapons. When Ninurta advanced against the firing weapons, Marduk retreated to the place of the great pulsating stone and lowered the sliding stone locks. Inanna and Ishkur entered the pyramid and they all decided to bury Marduk alive in his hiding chamber. Sarpanit, Marduk's wife, hurried to Enki for help. He sent her to Utu and Nanner under the belief that they could get through to Inanna, but once she pleaded with them, Inanna still demanded Marduk's death. At this time, Ninharzag summoned Enki and Enlil. She said that Marduk's death was not warranted, but that he deserved to be exiled instead, and that succession should pass to Ninurta. Enlil was pleased, but Enki's heart was heavy. He reluctantly decided to let Marduk live in exile in order to stop the war. Enlil took the opportunity to demand all launch facilities to be entrusted to him, that the land of the two Narrows be given to another of Enki's sons, and that the Igigi had to surrender the landing place. Finally, he demanded that Marduk be exiled to the land of no return. As a concession, Enki declared that Ningazita should be the master of the Eker. All agreed and Ningazita was sent to rescue Marduk. Ningazita devised an intricate plan to extract Marduk from the Eker and subsequently succeeded. Sarpanit and Nabu were reunited with Marduk outside the pyramid. When Enki informed Marduk of the terms of release, Marduk was enraged and stated he would rather die than forfeit his birthright. Sarpanit reminded him that he still had his family and a humbled Marduk departed with them to the land of no return. After they left, Ninurta re-entered the pyramid and retrieved the Destiny Stone and gave it to his lieutenants to destroy. He then removed the Gug Stone to an undisclosed location and salvaged the remaining intact Nibiru crystals. As Ninurta departed in his ship, he used his weapons to destroy the Apex Stone. A mount near the place of celestial chariots was chosen to replace the incapacitated beacon and the salvaged crystals and Gug Stone were installed. It was named Mount Mashu, meaning Mount of the Supreme Celestial Bark. At that point, Enlil summoned his three sons along with Ninlil and Ninharzag in order to give new assignments. Ninurta was granted Enlilship powers to be his father's surrogate in all lands. Iskur was granted lordship of the landing place in the Cedar Mountains. To the land south and east of the landing place, Nanner was given an everlasting endowment. Utu, as commander of the place and of the navel of the earth, was confirmed. As agreed by Enki, in the land of Two Narrows, lordship was assigned to Ningazita. But Inanna wanted her own domain and claimed that region in heritage to Dumuzi, and Enki and Enlil contemplated her request. Enki and Enlil counseled with Anu about the state of things. Almost two shars had passed from the time of the Great Deluge. By now, there were descendants of Susudra with intermixed Anunnaki genes. Offspring of the Igigi, who had intermarried, roamed about, and Cain's kinfolk still survived in the distant lands. The pure bloodline of the Anunnaki had greatly decreased in number. The question became, how over mankind can the few pure Anunnaki still achieve obedience and servitude? In response, Anu, with his spouse Antu, decided to come to Earth one more time. Tablet 12 begins with the Anunnaki on Earth preparing for Anu's and Antu's arrival from Nibiru. The city of Iridu was rebuilt and an abode for Enki and Ninki was constructed. However, Enki prepared a separate sanctuary to house the Mi formulas. 
For Enlil and Ninlil, a new Nibriki was established, and Enlil built an enormous walled-off abode there. Enlil stored the Tablet of Destinies in his abode where he protected them with his various weapons. He also had a separate hangar for his skybird. For Anu and Antu, a new palace named the House of Anu was built in Unugki, meaning the delightful place. When Anu's ship arrived at Earth, it was met with the skyships of the Anunnaki and guided to the landing place in Til Moon. Anu's three children, Inki, Enlil, and Inharzag, were there to greet them. Even though Anu and Antu were older than all of them, they in fact appeared younger. The group then left for the Eden and landed the skyships beside Unugki. Here they were greeted by all the Anunnaki who had stayed on Earth. In a large procession, they were escorted to the house of Anu. After getting washed up and rested, Anu and Antu took their thrones in the courtyard with Enlil, Inki, and Inharzag flanking them. As instructed by Inki, Zamul announced the rising of the planets and once Nibiru appeared, he signaled the hymn named The Planet of Anu to be sung, which in turn kicked off the celebration, along with bonfires being lit throughout Eden. After the banquet, Anu and Antu retired to the palace and slept for six days. After they awoke, their two sons and daughter were summoned to brief them on earth matters. They learned of how Enlil tried to wipe out the earthlings by not disclosing the great deluge but failed. Enlil revealed the gold discovery in the land beyond the oceans. Inki then revealed his dream vision and the tablet from Galzu. Anu was puzzled and explained that he never sent a secret emissary by that name. Inki explained that it was because of Galzu that Susudra and the Seed of Life were saved. Enlil added that it was Galzu who caused them to remain on Earth because he told them that they would die if they returned to Nibiru. Anu informed them that a return to Nibiru did cause havoc to their bodies, but that it could be cured with elixirs. When Inki and Enlil asked whose emissary was Galzu, Ninharzag surmised that Galzu appeared for the creator of all. The four of them sat quietly for a while in contemplation. Anu concluded that although the Anunnaki thought they were directing Earth's fate, they were instead being directed by destiny, and that they were simply emissaries to the Earthlings. Inki declared it was their mission to preserve and advance the Earthlings. They decided to provide knowledge to mankind and establish cities of man with sacred precincts for the Anunnaki. They passed kingship to mankind and used the system to enforce work and procurement. Four regions were established, three for mankind and one restricted. The first region was in Eden land and dominated by Enlil and his sons. The second region was in the land of the Two Narrows and it was designated for Inki and his sons. The third region was granted to Inanna. The fourth region was located on the peninsula of the Place of the Chariots. After the designation of regions, Anu turned his attention to his grandson Marduk and requested to see him. Before Anu and Antu set out to find Marduk, they visited Iridu and Nibriki. While in Iridu, Enlil complained that Enki was keeping the Mi formulas to himself, and Anu ordered Enki to share them. Anu and Antu returned to Anugki for one more night of rest. The next day, Inanna, Anu's great-granddaughter, showed up, and he took a liking to her. He gave the new palace to Inanna as a dowry and also promised her the skyship in which they surveyed the earth. Thereafter, Anu and Antu bid farewell to the Anunnaki and set course for the Golden Land with Enlil, Inki, Ninurta, and Ishkur accompanying them. Ninurta had built a golden palace for Anu and Antu by the shore of the Great Mountain Lake. After their arrival, Ninurta showed off the gold processing facilities. He also demonstrated the new metal alloy that they had created. Anu and Antu went sailing on the Great Lake from which the metals were procured and named it the Lake of Anak. Eventually, Marduk arrived with his son Nabu. When Inki asked about Sarpanet, Marduk informed him she had died. Anu hugged Marduk and let him know that he had been punished enough and was forgiven. At that point, Anu and Antu's celestial chariot was loaded to full capacity with gold and prepped for launch. Before taking off, Anu offered words of guidance to his children. Whatever destiny for the earth and the earthlings intended, 
let it so be. If man, not Anunnaki, to inherit the earth is destined, let us destiny help. Give mankind knowledge, up to a measure secrets of heaven and earth them teach. Laws of justice and righteousness teach them, then depart and leave. After Anu and Antu departed, Marduk angrily broke the silence. He wanted to know why he did not hear about the new palace of celestial chariots and what else had occurred without his knowledge. After Enki explained the decision concerning the four regions, Marduk lost his composure. He demanded to know why Inanna got her own region after being the cause of Demuzi's death. Enlil basically said that the decision was made and would not be changed. The group left to return to the Eden, but Enlil left Ishkur behind to watch over the gold. To commemorate Anu's visit, a new count of time was started that tracked Earth years instead of Nibiru Shars. It was designated the Age of the Bull and dedicated to Enlil. After returning to the Eden, the Anunnaki taught earthlings how to construct cities and implemented the kingship rules and rituals. Anu was given the rank of 60, and Enlil was given 50 as well as Ninurta. Enki was next in line with rank 40, and Nanner was assigned 30. To Enlil's son Utu, the rank of 20 was allotted. The rank of 10 was given to the Anunnaki leader's sons, and rank 5 to the spouses. Ninurta built a temple abode in Lagash within the Gursu precinct and housed his black skybird in the Ininu, meaning House of Fifty. Utu established a new sipper on top of its old location and built his abode named Ibabar, meaning Shining House. In a dab near Shurabak, Ninharzag received a new temple abode named House of Sucker and Healing Knowledge, where she kept the Mies containing the DNA information for Earthlings. Nanar was provided with the city Urum, meaning House of Thrones Seed. Ishkur returned to the mountain lands in his abode named House of the Seven Storms. Inanna resided in Unavki, which was bequeathed to her. Finally, Marduk and Nabu dwelt in Eden without any abodes of their own. In the lands of Eden, the first region was named of the Lofty Watchers. There, it was decided to let the earthlings possess their own city named Kishi, meaning Scepter City. Ninurta appointed the first king and obtained 50 Mies from Enki that held the divine kingship formulas. In Kishi, the humans were taught math, writing, beer making, metallurgy, wheeled wagon crafting, and the application of law. Meanwhile, Inanna waited impatiently in a Nugki for her own domain. She schemed to obtain the Mi of kingship from Enki. Inanna went to Iridu where she subsequently tricked Enki with a drinking game to obtain 94 Mi's and escape back to Anugki. Once Enki realized the trick, he sent his vizier Izamud to pursue Inanna and he called up to her right before she got back to her abode. Izamud returned Inanna to Iridu but she was no longer in possession of the Mi's. Enki held Inanna captive in his abode, and this caused Enlil to come to Iridu to face Enki. Inanna basically argued to Enlil that she obtained the Mies fair and square, and Enki begrudgingly admitted it. Enlil declared that after kingship was complete in Kishi, it would next pass to Anugki. When Marduk heard about the decision, he became unhinged and demanded from Enlil his own city in the Eden. Enlil ignored his demand, and Marduk decided to take matters into his own hands. Nabu summoned the Igigi to erect a new facility for Marduk at a location previously considered for Anu's arrival, and Marduk began construction on what is otherwise known as the Tower of Babel. When Enlil found out, he tried to placate Marduk and Nabu unsuccessfully and Niburki Enlil with his sons and grandchildren conferred and they decided Marduk must be stopped at all cost. Enlil developed a strategy to scatter Marduk's followers and to confound their understanding of speech. 310 years after the count of earth years began, Enlil instilled a different language and writing system in each region and every land. For 408 years, 23 kings reigned in Kishi. Among them was a beloved king named Itana, who was taken on a heavenly journey. After the allotted time, Enlil transferred kingship to Anukki. 
and the high priest of the Iana temple abode. A son of Utu was named the first king. Meanwhile, Marduk had retreated to the land of the Two Narrows in the second region where he found Ningazida in charge. Marduk was upset to find out that Ningazida had overturned many of his plans for the region. Marduk reasserted his authority over the region, and the two brothers ended up quarreling for the next 350 years. Eventually, Enki told Ningazida that he needed to depart the region, and Ningazida left with a band of followers to the land beyond the oceans. 650 earth years was the count at the time, but in Ningazida's new domain, where he was called the Winged Serpent, a brand new count began. Subsequently, Marduk became known as Ra, meaning Bright One, Inki as Pata, meaning Developer, and Ningazida as Tahuti, meaning Divine Measurer. Ra replaced Tahuti's face on the Sphinx with that of his son Asar and transitioned his region from a base 60 to a base 10 mathematical system. He also appointed a half Anunnaki half earthling named Mina as king. To honor his elders, Ra built a holy city named Anu, where he erected a temple abode for his father, Ptah. In order to benefit the second region, Ptah gave Ra all types of Mies. Ptah essentially taught Ra everything he knew except the knowledge of how to revive the dead. Ra was bestowed the constellation sign of Ram. After the Anunnaki leaders observed the success of the second region, they proceeded to establish the third region for Inanna. In the 860th Earth Year count, she received a celestial constellation named the Constellation of the Maiden. The third region was located in the far east, beyond the seven mountain ranges. Its highlands were called Samush, meaning land of sixty precious stones. Its great river valley was named Arata, meaning wooden realm. According to Enlil's decree, Enki devised a new writing and language system. Enki refused to bestow any new Mies to Inanna and declared that she used the ones she already obtained from Anugki. In Arata, Inanna appointed a shepherd chief that was related to Dumuzi. After Inanna journeyed to Arata, she left in Merkar as the ruler of Anugki. But in Merkar coveted Arata's riches and sent an emissary to the region to demand tribute. However, the emissary was unable to communicate with the king of Arata. The king of Arata sent a message on a wooden scepter back to Anugki requesting some mees and included a royal gift of donkeys loaded with grains. In Makar could not understand the message and ended up planting the scepter, which over the course of ten years grew into a tree. In frustration, In Makar appealed to his grandfather Utu, who in turn had Nesaba teach In Makar the Arata language. He then sent a message to Arata delivered by his son Banda, which demanded submission and threatened war. The king of Arata first suggested a one-on-one -on -one battle, but then submitted that they should peacefully exchange treasures. On his way back to deliver the message, Banda appeared to die. The treasure never reached Anukki, and the Mies were not obtained by Arata, which resulted in a stunted civilization in the third region. The traveling between Anugki and Arata had caused Inanna to become restless and ungratified. She was still not over Demuzi's death and was seeing his vision throughout the day and night. In the sacred precinct of Anugki, she established the house of nighttime pleasure. She lured young warriors on the night of their wedding to it with the promise of long life, but each was found dead in the morning. At this point, Banda returned to Anugki alive and well. Inanna mistook Banda for Demuzi and lured him to her bed like the others. When Banda was alive the next morning, Inanna took it as a sign that she was granted the power of immortality and declared herself a goddess. Her parents, Nanar and Ningal, were not pleased by her proclamation, nor were Enlil and Ninurta. While her brother Utu was amused by her claim, Enki and Ninharzag denied the possibility. Eventually, Banda succeeded his father in Makar on the throne and became known as Lugal, meaning great man. He married Ninsun and bore a son named Gilgamesh, who followed his father on the throne. As Gilgamesh grew older, he questioned his mother about the immortality of his Anunnaki ancestors. His mother told him 
As long as on earth you abide, the death of an earthling will you overwhelm. But if you to Nibiru will be taken, long life thereon you will attain. Ninsun repeatedly appealed to Utu to take Gilgamesh to Nibiru, and he eventually relented. To help protect and guide him, Ninharzag fashioned a double of Gilgamesh. His name was Enkidu, meaning as by Enki created. Gilgamesh and Enki journeyed to the landing place as Utu oversaw their progress. At the entrance of the cedar forest, they encountered a fire-belching monster which they vanquished. When they reached the secret tunnels of the Anunnaki, they were challenged by the Bull of Heaven. After Enkidu killed the bull, Enlil welled out in agony, recognizing it as a very bad omen. For his actions, Enkidu was given a punishment of death, but Gilgamesh was spared. Utu permitted Gilgamesh to proceed on his journey to the landing place. After many adventures, Gilgamesh reached Tilmun in the fourth region, where he met Susudra in a garden. Susudra recounted the events of the Great Deluge and then revealed to Gilgamesh the secret of long living. He explained that a plant in the garden prevented him and his spouse from aging and that it had been a gift from Enki with Enlil's blessing on the Mount of Salvation. When Susudra and his spouse were asleep, Gilgamesh secured the plant and headed back to Anugki. On the way, Gilgamesh fell asleep and the plant was stolen by a snake. Gilgamesh subsequently returned to Anugki and dies as a mortal. After seven more kings in Anugki, the kingship there came to an end. Precisely at the count of a thousand years, to Urim, the city of Nanar and Ningal, the first region was kinship transferred. Meanwhile, Marduk slash Ra was paying attention to Inanna's actions and was determined to counteract her schemes. He was angered by the fact that Gilgamesh was permitted to seek immortality. He decided that the king in the second region should be given the same allowance. He taught the kings to build their tombs, eastward facing, and dictated a long book to the priest scribes which described the afterlife journey and how to reach the Duat, the place of celestial boats. From there they would take the stairway of heaven to the imperishable planet. He set out on campaigns of invasion in his brother's realms. His brothers appealed to their father Ptah, but Ra paid no attention and endeavored to be the master of all four regions. After kingship transferred to Urim, Nanar established twelve monthly festivals dedicated to great Anunnaki. In the first region, shrines were built so the people could directly pray to their gods. While Urim prospered, Inanna roamed from region to region. She hung out with Utu, Ishkur, and liked to dwell with the people in the upper plain of the two rivers. She learned to speak their language where she became known as Ishtar. Her city Anugki was called Uruk and Ishkur was known as Adad. Her father Nanar was known as Sin and Urim was called Ur. Utu became known as Shamash and Nibirki was called Nippur. In Sumer, in the first region, the kingship was rotated, but in the second region, Ra alone reigned. Ra decreed himself above all other gods and claimed to possess all their powers and attributes. His actions greatly alarmed the Anunnaki leaders. His brothers conferred with their father Enki, and Nergal conveyed concerns to Ninurta. Enki confronted Marduk and asked him what was his problem. Marduk explained that Enlil's constellation sign had been slain and the omens dictated his age. The age of the ram was coming. But after observations by Enki, Enlil, Nanar, and Nergal, it was determined that the time of the ram was still remote. Marduk ignored them and sent emissaries all over the place announcing that his time had come. The Anunnaki leaders appealed to Ningazita to teach the people how to observe the skies. After he devised a method, Ninurta and Ishkur helped erect stone structures that allowed the people to observe. The Anunnaki decided to unify the first region under one leader, a warrior king named Sharukin, meaning righteous regent. As once had been done on Nibiru, a new crown city was established. It was called Agade, meaning unified city. Enlil empowered Sharukin and Inanna accompanied him with her weapons of brilliance. All the while, Ra kept track of Inanna's and Sharukin's movements. After Sharukin moved the sacred soil from the location of Marduk's previous tower to heaven attempt, 
Marduk invaded with Nabu and his followers. He decreed a gateway of the gods to be established, and Nabu named it Babylon. This infuriated Inanna, who immediately inflicted death upon Marduk's followers. Inanna's carnage was like nothing seen before on earth. Nergal went to Babylon and persuaded his brother to leave and wait for the true signs of heaven. Marduk departed and traveled from land to land, watching the skies and waiting. From that time forward, he was called Amun, meaning unseen one. After Marduk's departure, Inanna was appeased for a while, but when Shurukin's grandson, Naram Sin, took the throne and Enlil and Ninurta were absent in the first region, Inanna saw her chance to seize power. She ordered Naram Sim to march against Marduk's domains, which caused him to pass through the fourth region. This sacrilege caused Enlil to put a curse on Naram Sin and a gade whereby he was killed by a scorpion and a gade was wiped out. All of this transpired at the count of 1,500 earth years. The result of Agade's destruction was disorder and confusion. Kingship in the first region was in disarray. After consulting with Anu, Enlil directed kingship to be directed by Nanner. In Urum, Nanner granted kingship to a righteous shepherd of men named ur Namu. Under his rule, the lands prospered in abundance. It was during this time that Enlil had a dream vision and was visited by Galzu. In his hand, Galzu held a tablet which displayed the twelve constellation signs. Galzu moved his finger from the bull to the ram three times. Galzu spoke, The righteous time of benevolence and peace by evil doing and bloodshed will be followed. In three celestial portions, the ram of Marduk, the bull of Enlil, will replace one who himself as supreme god has declared supremacy over earth will seize. A calamity as has never before occurred by fate decreed will happen. As at the time of the deluge a righteous and worthy man must be chosen, by him and his seed will civilize man, as by the creator of all intended, be preserved. When Enlil awoke, he saw no tablet and wondered if he had imagined the event. He went to the Niburki temple and consulted with the oracle priest Terhu. Enlil instructed him to go to Nanner's temple in Urum and observe celestial time for 72 earth years. In the meantime, Marduk was traveling from land to land, exerting his supremacy and gaining followers. Near the fourth region, Nabu was inciting the people and clashes occurred between the dwellers of the west and the dwellers of the east. As armies were formed, and city walls were raised, Enlil realized Galzu's prophecy was happening. He also realized that Tahu was the man Galzu indicated should be the chosen one. Enlil revealed his dream vision to Nanner and instructed him to establish a city like Urum and create an abode for himself in Ningal. In the new city, Nanner was to establish a temple shrine and appoint Tahu in charge. Nanner followed his father's instructions and established the city of Haran. When 48 years passed, Terhu and his family moved to Haran. At this time in Urum, Urnamu was killed in a chariot accident and was succeeded by his son Shulji. He was eager for battles and anointed himself high priest of Nibruki. Shulji also desired to have Inanna. He enlisted warriors from the mountain lands and overran the western lands, including the mission control center. He entered into the fourth region and declared himself king of all four regions. Enlil was angered and turned his attention to Ebram, the eldest son of Terhu. He directed Ebram to protect the sacred places and to make sure takeoffs and landings were unhindered. As soon as Ebram departed Haran, Marduk arrived. He immediately began raising an army which continued for the next 24 years. At that point, Marduk made an appeal. O gods of Haran, O great gods who judge, learn my secrets. As I girdle my belt, my memories I remember. I am the divine Marduk, a great god, in my domains as Ra am I known. For my sins to exile I went, to the mountains have I gone, in many lands I wandered. From where the sun rises to where the sun sets I went, to the land of Ishkur I came. Twenty-four years in the midst of Haran I nested, an omen in its temples I sought. 
until when about my lordship and omen in the temple I ask? Your days of exile are completed to me, the oracle in the temple said. O great gods who the fates determine, let me to my city set my course. My temple, Esagil, as an everlasting abode establish, a king in Babylon install. In my temple house, let all the Anunnaki gods assemble, my covenant accept. The Anunnaki gods were disturbed and alarmed by his appeal. Enlil summoned all the Anunnaki leaders to Niburki, including Marduk's brothers. All of them stood in opposition to Marduk and Nubu. Enki counseled them that they could not prevent what was coming and that they should go ahead and accept Marduk's supremacy. Enlil angrily proposed that Marduk be deprived of the bond heaven earth. With the exception of Enki, they all agreed to destroy the place of celestial chariots and Nergal suggested the use of weapons of terror. They contacted Anu, and he was in agreement. As he departed, Enki warned them their plan was destined to fail. During this process, Enlil never disclosed his dream vision of Galzu, nor did he reveal that he knew the hiding place of the weapons. Although Enki departed the chamber in anger and disgust, he was still under the impression that only he knew the location of the weapons. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and Enlil informed Ninurta and Nergal of their location and how to arm them. Enlil warned them that the cities must be vacated and the people spared. Before the two left, Enlil revealed to his son Ninurta the prophecy of Galzu and his choice of Ibram. Once they arrived at the weapon's hiding place, they were armed, and Nergal gave each a task name. The one without rival, the blazing flame, the one who with Terra crumbles, mountain melter, wind that the rim of the world seeks, the one who above and below no one spares, and vaporizer of living things. At this point, Nergal was in a frenzy ready to annihilate everyone. Ninurta asked him, Will you, the righteous with the unrighteous, destroy? Nergal responded, The instructions of Enlil are clear. To the selected targets the way I will lead, you behind me will follow. The decision of the Anunnaki to me is known. The two of them awaited Enlil's signal for seven days and seven nights. Meanwhile, Marduk returned to Babylon and declared his supremacy in the presence of his followers. It was at the count of 1,736 earth years that Enlil sent the signal. Ninurta struck the heart of the fourth region first followed by the place of celestial chariots. Next, Nergal flew to the verdant valley of the five cities and hit each with a weapon causing complete desolation. All who lived there were vaporized. After the weapon detonations, Ninurta and Nergal were puzzled by their observations. A storm formed in a dark swirling cloud creating an evil wind. Later in the day, the sun was eventually blacked out and by night the moon was not visible. The next morning, a storm wind began blowing from the west. The dark brown cloud began moving eastward toward the settled lands. It killed everything in its path. Nergal and Nernurda immediately warned Enlil and Enki of the unstoppable evil wind. They, in turn, warned the people in Sumer to disperse and hide, but it was too late. Total annihilation stretched from Iridu in the south to Sipper in the north. Ironically, Babylon, where Marduk resided, was spared. The final tablet opens with Enki and Enlil surveying the aftermath of the Great Calamity. Enki concluded that the supremacy of Marduk had been destined and confirmed by the sparing of Babylon. He said it was the will of the creator of all. Finally, Enlil revealed to his brother the dream vision of Galzu. Enki asked Enlil if he had been given the prophecy, why did he not prevent the use of the weapons? Enlil answered, My brother, enough seen was the reason. Whenever after your coming to earth the mission by an obstacle obstructed was, a way the obstruction to circumvent we have found. Of that, the fashioning of the earthlings, the greatest solution, also the fountain of a myriad unwanted twists and turns was. When you have the celestial cycles fathomed and the constellations assigned, who in them the hands of destiny could foresee, 
Who could between our chosen fates and our unbending destiny distinguish? Who false omens proclaimed? Who true prophecies could pronounce? Therefore, to keep to myself the words of Galzu I decided, was he truly the creator of all's emissary? Was he my hallucination? Let whatever has to happen, happen. So to myself I said. Inky reminded Enlil that regardless of his logic, the first region was desolated, the second region was in chaos, and the third region was wounded. Enlil shot back, telling Inky that if it were the will of the creator of all, then it was going to go down that way no matter what he did. Enlil then relented and gave the rank of 50 that he had intended for Ninurta to Marduk instead. He said, let Marduk over the desolation in the regions his supremacy declare. As for me and Ninurta, we will in his way no longer stand. To the lands beyond the oceans we will depart. What we had all come for, the mission to obtain for Nibiru gold, we will complete. Inki questioned his brother if matters would have been different if the weapons were not used. Enlil responded by asking Inki if they would have instead not returned to Nibiru according to Galzu's warning. Enlil basically said what was done was done and could not be undone. Inki said, is not in that too a lesson? Is not what on earth happened, what on Nibiru had taken place mirrored? Is not in that tale of the past the outline of the future written? Will mankind in our image created our attainments and failures repeat. Enlil was silent. When he stood up, Inki embraced him and Enlil returned the sentiment before departing. Inki, now alone, contemplated how it had all began and where they had ended up. He pondered all the decisions made and if they were directed by fate or destiny. He wondered about the cyclical nature of the universe and if the future was destined to repeat the past. He then made a decision. All the events and decisions, starting with Nibiru to this day on Earth, to put in a record, a guide to future generations to become. Let posterity at a time by destiny designated, the record read, the past remember, the future as prophecy understand. Let the future of the past the judge be.